the Israel war. And literally this happened. I kid you not, I was preaching yesterday at a conference in Missouri. And literally on the plane ride, God worked in my heart and says, no, we got to deal with this. And so we are going to deal with this. So over the next couple of weeks, why is this happening? Believe it or not, the Bible is uh, replete with why this conflict is going. It shouldn't catch us off guard if you read the Bible. But what's concerning, have you seen the news? You got Christians that are, frankly, full of anti-Semitism. This is nuts. And we're going to take a look at this. So we're going to interrupt our Schwab in the deck uh, with a, probably a few weeks study, if we're alive and still here, uh, with a study on Israel. So we can have a proper biblical perspective of, frankly, what's going on right now in the news. It's not my chance. It's all a huge sign uh, of our wedding day approaches. In fact, that's, I don't know if you've seen the meme out there. As the world prepares for war, we're preparing for a wedding. That should be our attitude uh, as Christians. So, uh, so that's the good news. But hey, beyond that, we got some other good news. We got all kinds of announcements going on today. Sunday school. Sunday school, you know what's so cool about Sunday school? Is it happens on Sundays. You guys are reading, catching on. Praise God. Caffeine is kicking in. This is awesome, right? Uh, but Sunday school, just to remind you, we got uh, children's nursery. The nursery aspect, just to give you, uh, again, because of all of our new development and expansion, nursery is still here over here, but the children's ministry is in our expansion facility next door, the 5,000 square foot facility and things of that nature. That's every Sunday. Also, we've just started uh, a prayer ministry. We have a new prayer room at the back behind over here so that in between services, after services, if you need prayer for something, certainly if you want to pray and receive Christ your Savior, you can do that right now. But certainly if you want somebody to pray with for whatever, we have the prayer uh, there afterwards of that. Homeschool on Mondays. Get your kids out of the sewer pipe. That's about as blunt as you can get, folks. It's sick what's going on, and what are you waiting for? Uh, so see Arlene. She's right over here. Hi, Arlene. How are you doing? Do you still talk like that, or is that just me? It's just me. But anyway, so she's over there. See Arlene. Get you hooked up. Show you how to do it with the Rose. Meet here on Monday. Also Fridays, they have play day, things of that nature. Uh, I'm telling you, we did it with our kids uh, for, uh, you know, 18 years. Uh, do not regret one minute of it. I'm so glad that we had the privilege uh, with our kids to do homeschool. But we, it's got easy here. And not just homeschool. You can right now here at Sunrise, you can go all the way from kindergarten all the way to doctoral level training if you want to do that. Uh, God's allowed us that privilege. So see John about that also Mondays, but at 6 p.m. Wednesday's Bible study uh, with this lady I personally know. Yeah, that's my wife, Brandy. And uh, Tuesdays, 6.30 if you want to be a part of that. Wednesday, if you, how many guys are here last Wednesday? We just started our first study on Freemasonry, secret societies. And if you weren't there, we were about as blunt as you can get. If you profess to be a Christian and you're part of Freemasonry, you better repent and you better run. It's extremely ungodly. And things of that nature. But we just started that Wednesday night. But at the same time, at the expansion facility, we have our kids' ministry next door. Uh, another ministry, men's uh, Bible study next door, 9 a.m. on Saturdays, if you want to be a part. And if you want to help out, uh, which seems like it should be in the Bible somewhere, that Christians help, Christians serve. Is that is it? Or is my reading the wrong Bible? Okay, I'm just checking. Right? No, but if you'd like to help out, uh, maybe kids' ministry, see Lindsay or Christina there. Uh, or if you'd like to help out with a gift of helps with uh, maybe cleaning or the coffee bar, you can see Debbie for that. Or Rhonda, you can see with the connection crew, uh, the ladies out there welcoming everybody. And if you'd like to become a member, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. You can sign up for that. Holy Trinity Medical Practice. Whoa, what's up with that? Well, praise God. You talk about a blessing. In the days where the medical community has basically come murder for hire. Is that, a, is that using hyperbole or is that really what's going That's really what's going on. Praise God for his provision. He's raised up Christian staff for us and the community. Dr. Mick and Nurse Heather, there to help for your every needs. And, and how do you get to be a part of it? You call 702-849-9092. Also, not just here locally, but telehealth options. Telehealth option. And uh, so uh, if you're interested in doing that, but you can go there in the foyer at the Connection Center. You'll see that card right here. Grab one for yourself, 702-849-9092. Faithful Medicine, medicine here to help you, not kill you, uh, believe it or not, is the tagline. As crazy as that sounds, the days we live in, uh, that's what's going on. So consider that. We are already opening up for uh, Aetna is our first insurance. And just talked to Dr. Mick, but I can't announce it. But there's another second and third coming really fast. So be a part of that. So things are moving. It takes a while. We're working with the government. So it takes a little while for those of you wondering. Uh, but speaking of which, next door. We're in the mobile unit right now. A couple of weeks, Lord willing, next to the expansion facility, a brand new 2,000 square foot 
medical facility open up right next door to us. So consider that. Pray about that. God's doing a neat work here at Sunrise. Every place I've shared, including in Europe, we were there a couple weeks ago uh, preaching the gospel over there. They're just blown away. And everybody's saying the same thing. Wish we had this. Well, folks, we got it. God's blessed us with it. Take advantage of that. Also take advantage of Lord willing for still alive and still here. Our next conference here at Sunrise, November 11th and 12th, Saturday and Sunday, both services. Yours truly will be speaking. Lord willing, I'll be speaking on giants, not just before, but after. What's up with that dude with the 13 foot long bed? Is that real in the scripture? Yes, it was. We'll talk about how that's about. That's my message. Uh, Ken Michael from Jan Markell Ministries was preaching with him yesterday in Missouri. He and I were doing a conference out there. Great guy, fantastic messages. And Pastor Tom Hughes from Hope for Our Times will also be here. It's free, but you need to sign up uh, so we can have a head count to know how to deal with the traffic. Go to getalifemedia.com, the teaching website, look for that banner, click on it, sign up, uh, and then we'll be able to get an accurate head count. We got people all over the country and out of the country that have already signed up and they're planning on being with us. It's going to be a great time if we're still alive and still here. It's almost like there's stuff going on in the world that Whew, it's getting close, man. I tell you what. Uh, but hey, we want to welcome you here. And if this is your first time with us, or if you've been here for a few weeks, and if you've yet to fill out one of these exciting Connect cards, if you could fill that out for us, it should be somewhere near you. And if you could do one of two things with it, you could put one of the two offering boxes as we exit there in the back, or give it to one of the ladies there at the Connection Center, and they will mug you in Christian love. And believe it or not, there's a food product that's in here. Don't worry about it, because if for some reason you get ill, we got a medical facility right next door. So it's up and No, it should be good. It should be good. I don't know what it is, but it should be good. That's right. But if you could do that for us, that'd be great. We'd love to connect with you uh, as our guest today. Uh, also, we want to connect with not only you here today, but also, again, we started this last week, uh, our home churches. God's been doing a lot of home churches that we get to be a part of. Christians can't find a healthy church, so now they're starting to be the church around the world. And today's home church that we are now connected with is in Mexico. Uh, this is Kevin and Leanne in Mexico, and they have taken up on the offer. They can't find a church, so they started a church there uh, through Sunrise, through us, uh, as that nature. And I want to share with you a report uh, that he has uh, shared with this. Watch this. Uh, Kevin speaking. He says, I had taken two shots of the Pfizer vax July 2021. Whereas my wife had the AstraZeneca vax. This was a before, before Jesus saved my wife and I at the end of November 2021 for me and the start of December 2021 for my wife. Well, when we arrived in Mexico, we found out from our doctor here that I was suffering from blood clotting and was advised that it was highly probable that I would die within a year and that he had nine patients die within the previous 12 months. To shorten a long story, without treatment or medication, the Lord Jesus Christ healed me of the clotting completely, evidenced by my D-dimer blood test reading, returning to a low end of the normal range. This shocked the doctor who said that he had not seen or heard anyone recovering from the vax-induced blood clotting yet. He literally sat back in his chair with a stunned look on his face and just stared in silence at the blood test reading for what felt like 10 minutes before he even said a word. He said, I looked at his notes in the outcome section, and all he wrote regarding the blood clotting problem was, quote, cured with three question marks. So I give all the credit and glory to the Lord Jesus alone that I'm still alive, and I thank him every morning for that, and I ask him to use me and this life for his purposes, for me and my life are to do with whatever he pleases. We study with Pastor Billy every day, give or take a day here and there. Currently, my wife and I together are working through the Discipleship 102 studies, and we're following along with AJ's Revelation study. And on my own, I'm following with Pastor Billy's uh, Klaus Schwab sermon series, The Voodoo Vampires and Rise of the Demon Worship, The World Religions, Cults, and the Occult. Please listen. Please let everyone know that we thank God for answering our prayers because he led us to one of his true churches, to Sunrise Bible Church. This is Kevin and Leanne in Mexico. They're down there. And this is what's going on. We're in the apostasy, so people are tuning into our studies, basically starting home churches, which really is what? We're going right back where it started. How did the church start? Acts 2, in homes. Now we're in the last days, and guess what? We're back there. Okay, not a surprise. But that's right, on the count of three, we're going to say in our best what? Mexican accent. Come on! If you guys can do Alabama, you can do this one. So that's right, on the count of three, we'll give a big old howdy-ho to Sunrise Home Church, Kevin and Leanne in Mexico. One, two, three! I don't know what that was, but it wasn't Mexican. 
But hopefully it gets transferred into something good. I, we do care for you, Kevin and Leanne. That's all I got to say. But anyway, that's right. Hey, but again, speaking of home church, for those of you tuning in line, we're serious. And this is happening all over the world. Uh, home church at getlifemedia.net. Send us an email. If you can't find a church, okay, guess what? We're in the apostasy. We're living it live. The good news is you can be the church in your area. We'll do the teaching for you. We'll show you. We'll contact you. Contact us. Let us know you're interested and then consider being that church. Here locally or part of an online family, the fastest way to get your prayer request uh, to our prayer team that's ever growing, it's fantastic what God's doing, is right there, prayer at getalifemedia.net. Again, not just our online community, but here locally, if you got a prayer request at any time during the week, whenever, right there, prayer at getalifemedia.net, and we'll take that to the Lord. But hey, we also want to uh, take an offering this morning, and if you'd like to partake in that, you are more than welcome to do so. Again, you could just... As we exit, put in one of the two offering boxes as we exit there at the back of the sanctuary. Or if you're part of our online family, and if you'd like to give, that's greatly appreciated. You can do that in three different ways. Go to the appropriate website, uh, look for the mailing address, or on the website there should say donate or give. You can do that. Click on that. Or even now, there should be a number that's appearing on your screen. That's your texting option if you'd like to text give. But let's pray for that. And let's pray for our study that interrupted our other study that interrupted our other study. <laughs> due to current events. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you so much. And we do thank you for Jesus, for raising us up, up out of the muck and the mire, the pit that we were in, headed to hell, and you've given us such an incredible future. Ah, oh, and what a future that's going to be. And nobody can take it away. We do sing praises to you this morning. We also thank you that in the meantime, as we await that future, we can, we can come here as your people with relative ease at this time. We can study your word. We can encourage one another. We can fellowship. We could serve one another, but we could also give of our time, our tongues, our talent, or even our treasure for your purposes, for your glory. And so if we give today, we pray with everything we do, may it be biblical, that we'd have the right heart. You tell us here, if we're going to give, a cheerful giver, not because we have to. You say, don't give under compulsion, not because you have to, not because somebody's looking at you, not because you feel guilty. It's like with everything. It's because we love you. We want to. You don't need our money. You want our heart. But this is just one of those practical ways that we can work together as your people, making a difference while we're still here on earth. And so if we give today, we ask that you be glorified in it, God. That we, your church here at Sunrise, would have whatever resources we need to keep moving forward for you. Declaring your truth to as many as we can, because time is getting short. And that lost souls will be one for you, whether it's here in Las Vegas, whether it be the Henderson area, whether it be down with Mexico with Kevin and Leanne. And the home church down there, God, please, may this offering help people come to know you, Jesus, as their Savior. And God, is again, we, now we turn to your word. Please give us the right heart, not just with giving, but now may we give our ears and our heart, that we would not be hearers only, but doers of your word. And may we translate basically what's going on in the world right now, which doesn't catch you off guard because you prophesied these things would happen. And so again, the message is this. We're not to react to it like the world the world is preparing for war, <laughs> but we're preparing for a wedding. It just simply means our departure's near, so we need to finish strong as your people, to be faithful. We're on a giant rescue mission. You're going to rescue us and pull us out of this time frame called the seven-year tribulation because we are not appointed unto your wrath. But there are people in need of saving. May we not sit in our lifeboat and just wave at people. May we pull people in with us while there's time. But God, again, if there's anybody here today or watching online that's not truly saved, please save them. Please have mercy on them like you did with me 30 years ago. Rescue them. Draw them to you. Because that's why you have them tuning in or that's why you have them here today. Because you're reaching out to them to receive your love and forgiveness through Jesus so they will not be left behind to face the worst time in the history of mankind, let alone hell for all eternity. So God, please, if that's the case, save them today before it's too late. We ask your blessings upon our study. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, that's right. Hey, I just got back, as I mentioned to you, uh, in Missouri. Missouri, Midwest. You ever, I grew up there in Kansas. There's one thing that's about the Midwest, especially if you get in Missouri, and then you get, go a little lower to Arkansas. That's tick country. Everything, I mean, big old ticks, big giant ticks. Hope your breakfast was good. But anyway, big old ticks and bugs and things. That, weird animals. Anyway, so you're out there in the Midwest, right? And you're driving around. You ever run across some weird signs? Weird, like local signs, weird signs out there. Like, oh, planet. 
Okay, for those of you who have no clue what I'm talking about, apparently only three of us grew up in the Midwest. Let me share with you some actual weird science. And these aren't just weird science. They're specifically animal science. You're going, are, what? Is it, are you really dealing with this in your area? Well, let's take a look at that. I'm not joking. Here's one of them. Please drive slowly. Our squirrels don't know one nut from another. <laughs> so apparently you're driving by. If the squirrel's looking at you, you're the nut. I don't know. But that's the thing. Watch this one. What is this? <laughs> now, I don't know where it's at. I assume Florida. But I'm going, that's a bad two-bang punch. You got hills like that for people in wheelchairs, and then they end up with an alligator. That's not good. That is definitely not good. Move out of that state. Or here's this one. Warning, please look under your vehicle for penguins. Don't you hate that? I mean, you're just trying to get from point A to B, and there's that penguin again. I tell you what. What is this? What's this one? Before, after. Turn to somebody and say, well, duh. That's what's going to happen after I hit it. You didn't need to tell me that. I didn't need to sign for that. Watch this one. Look at that. Whoa. That's dangerous. That's called bucking the system or something. I don't know what's going on with that one. But whoo, man, I thought it was crazy out here. Hey, baboons. 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 I Listen, I don't know every animal species on the planet, but I can say this. That's not a baboon. Right? It's, what? That's crazy. Watch this one. Beware of B. Singular. Because apparently it's a big B. That's a Nephilim B. It's a B. And you, your life's over. It's bees. But no, this is a B. Beware the B. Now, speaking of Nephilim, I'm not joking. Watch this, son. This is crazy. Look at that. You know where that's at? I'm not a prophet nor the son thereof, but that's got to be either Michigan or Wisconsin because they are that big up there for those of you who lived in that area of the country. And you're like, like an airport on your forearm. I tell you what. Hey, not only that. Hey, look at this. Invincible moose. Just avoid the area. And it's for five miles. Give it up. He's invincible. He's going to crush your car. It's crazy. Not only that, look at this one. This one gives me nightmares. Look at that falling cow. Oh. <laughs> and the reason why it gives me nightmares is not because I'm afraid that the cow's falling. I want the cow to fall. That's fresh meat. But I ain't got a truck to haul it in. But that's just my dilemma that I have to deal with. But not only that, look at this one. That thing's going to get you over the mountain. <laughs> what is what is that? Oh, I'll tell you what. The craziest animal sign I've ever seen is this one, the attack chicken signs. Have you seen those? Those are actually out there. And you guys go, there you go, Pastor Billy, once again, talking about these attack chickens. And one of these days, we're going to find out why in the world that you just don't like chickens. I don't, maybe, the, maybe one of these days, you'll figure it out. What happened to you as a little kid? I don't know, but maybe one day we'll find out. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, believe it or not, folks, as crazy as those animal signs are, did you know that God talks about animal signs in the seven-year tribulation, okay? And if you see this sign from these animals, that means you got left behind. You made the biggest mistake of your life. Because watch what God says about the animals uh, in the seven-year tribulation. This is what we see in the first half in the sealed judgments, Revelation 6, 8. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was falling close behind him. And what happened? Here's what he says. He says, they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by what? Sword, famine, and plague. And by the what? The wild beasts of the earth. They will <laughs> go over the mountain and get you and eat you alive. It's crazy. Animals, beasts. You don't want to be there. And here's the good news. You don't have to. Jesus has been warning us for 2,000 years of this time frame that was just described. And that's just the first half, and they're just getting started. By the way, one-fourth of the earth, what's that? Two, not million, two billion people are going to go just like that, and you're just getting started. All this evil, the suffering, this tyranny, the schwab in the deck, all this crazy stuff that's going on, God's going to have the last word on it, folks. He ain't going to let it go on forever. Today is the day of grace. You need to get saved. But be sure, bang, judgment day is going to come. And you don't want to be there. You want to escape the judgment through Jesus Christ, right? But God, he's not just a God of, of wrath. He's a God of love. He tells us, Jesus said, Matthew 24, this time frame is the worst time in the history of mankind. So horrible that if God didn't just keep it to seven years, the entire human race would be destroyed. And because he's a God of love, that's why he's been telling us for 2,000 years. Here's a sign. Here's a sign. Here's another sign. Here's a sign. It's getting close. So get saved before it's too late. That's what you'd expect if he's a God of love. And that's what we get, including, believe it or not, folks, what we're seeing in the news right now. The Bible has a lot of information on basically the news right now. This war, this conflict, it's not by chance. 
And what's crazy is, so this is why we're going to deal with it, because we need to deal with it, because the Bible tells us, the only book on the planet, the Bible tells us why this conflict is happening. And not just as a sign that we're living in the last days, but so that we get the proper biblical perspective on it. Okay, God wants us to know why. And what's crazy is, have you seen it out there? You got professing Christians, not just the world. I expect that. I don't condone that. I expect that. They're out there with all this now anti-Semitism stuff. But now it's coming from so-called Christians. What is going on? What Bible are they reading? That's why we're going to begin to deal with this, Lord willing, over the next few weeks. And the first reason why there's a conflict, why this is happening right now, it's it's a conflict over the land, right? Let's sing that song. This land is my land. This la- hey, it's Vegas. You got to sing it in Vegas style. This land is your land. But see, isn't that the issue? It's my land. No, it's your land. No, it's my land. No, it's yours. No, it's Israel's land. No, it's Palestine. And that's why, believe it or not, that's the first reason why this conflict is appearing. Because that's all you hear in the news. It's theirs. No, it's mine. It's theirs. It's not. They didn't get a right to it. No, they it's mine. It's a conflict over the land. Now, if you read the Bible, which for some reason I highly recommend, you realize there is no conflict. God created the earth and God gave the land to Israel. But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God's Isaiah chapter 11. Let's begin that journey. God is very blunt about this. There should be no conflict over there, over this land that we keep seeing in the news because it's Israel's from the very get-go. And then God not only gave it to him, what we're going to see is he said, even though they're going to be scattered, I'm going to bring them back to the land that I gave them in the first place as a sign that you're in the last days. But let's take a look at that. Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to read just verses 11 through 12. And let's take a look at the context there is the prophecy concerning the one who would come from the roots of Jesse, obviously Jesus, the Messiah who would come. And then one day, ultimately at a second coming, he would come and establish the millennial kingdom. But God says he's going to do something else, right? And it has everything to do with Israel. But verse 11 says this in chapter 11, Isaiah, in that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left from his people, the Israelites, from Assyria from Lower Egypt, from the Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the uh, islands of the sea. And he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of who? Israel. He, God, will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Well, there you go. The earth is flat. It's a square. It's a four. No, it's not. It just is a euphemism for the whole world. That's a whole nother sermon, but you may be seated if you can, right? And so here's what we see here. God is declaring that one day against all odds, no matter what it looks like, no matter how far it's gone, the people who were no people, and that's exactly what happened to the Jewish people, after 70 AD, when the Romans came in and sacked Jerusalem, which fulfilled the prophecy made by Jesus, by the way, because he tells the truth and he is the truth. He's only telling the truth. And so after that, the Jewish people were scattered. No, listen. In the history of all mankind, no people has become a non-people and left their nation and ever come back again. But what happened in 1948? Israel Israel came back again. It's a huge mega sign that we're in the last days. Okay, And it's obvious that the reason why God gave them the land in the first place and then he's going to return to the land is because they've only ever obeyed God. No. Like you and I, they've blown it. But like you and I, they've been given an unconditional covenant, right? God gave them an unconditional covenant for this lamb, just like you and I have an unconditional covenant, praise God, that it's not by our works. It's by the grace and mercy of God sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. That's why we're guaranteed heaven. That's called an unconditional covenant. Are you glad for that? He did the same thing with Israel when it came concerning the land, right? And because you have some people that, well, because they disobeyed and God, he's done with them. No, he's not, not even close. But let's take a look at a couple of those passages telling us about this. Ezekiel 36, therefore say this to the house of Israel. This is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things. But for why? What's the motive? God says it's for the sake of my holy name which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to what? Your own land. 
and you will live in the land I gave what? To your forefathers, you will be my people, and I will be your God. Jeremiah says the same thing. However, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when men will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt. No, instead they're going to say this, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north, and out of all the countries where he had banished them, for I will restore them to the what? The land I gave to their forefathers. So again, God is very blunt. Uh, there's tons of scriptures that tell us this. The land was given by God to the Jewish peoples. And why did he do it? Because they were perfect? No, it's an unconditional promise. Okay, why? To declare his glory. So that people will know that he's real. And dare I say that he's a God who keeps his promises. Listen, this is no major rub. This is no minor issue. When people say, oh, God's done with Israel. What do you mean he's done with Israel? God has made unconditional, eternal promises to Israel, including the land. And if God can't keep that promise, how can we trust him with ours? Amen. This is not a small issue. And yet people are saying, nah, he's done with them. We'll get to that in a second. But here's the important. This incredible gathering of the Jews, as promised by God, to the land that he gave them, is a huge sign that we're in the last days. And God was very specific. He didn't just say he was going to do it. He even called out before he did it, the exact order that he was going to do that. And that's another prophecy that we see here now in Isaiah 43. Do not be afraid for I'm with you, God says. Speaking to Israel, he said, I will bring your children from the east, gather you from the what? West. And then what? Then he says, I'm going to say to the north, give them up. And then I'm going to say to the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Again, ever since 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the temple and sacked Jerusalem, the people of Israel, they've been scattered across the world. But against all odds, and this has never happened. Only the Jewish people has this happened. God in the last day says, I'm going to bring you back from all over, from the four corners. And not just the four corners. He called out the exact order. In the past century alone, folks, this has happened before our very eyes. And God says, I'm going to do it in the last days. Now, let's talk about the order. What was the first place he said he's going to gather them from? From the east. This actually happened in this order. Early 1900s, that's when from the east, many Jews living in the Middle East began to move back to Israel. God began to stir their hearts. And they said, you know what? Okay, we're doing okay here, but we got to get back to the homeland, the land of our forefathers, the land that God gave us. Then from the West, this was in the mid-1900s, hundreds of thousands of Jews living in the West, the Europe, and, and, and even further West, the United States, began to go back to Israel. And then in 1900, there were only 40,000 Jews in all of Israel, but by the end of World War II, that number ballooned to 600,000. But that was just the East and the West. What was the next one? God said from the North. And in the North, during the 1980s and the early 90s, Russia finally began to allow, because they weren't allowing them to, began to allow thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews to return to Israel. Uh, we may not know this, but at that time, Russia had the largest population of the Jewish people, but they would not let them return to the land. They were literally being held captive there. And then, of course, while they're there, shocker, countries seem to always do this, Russians hated the Jews. They blamed them for all their problems. Sound familiar today? Right? But what did God say? He says, I'm going to say to the north, you better give them up. And guess what? God doesn't lose. And they gave him up. You know why? Because some trouble got stirred up. Hmm. And you know what it was? The fulfillment of the prophecy, the Russian empire began to crumble during the Gorbachev years. And so guess what happened? It suddenly opened the door for the Jewish people to come back to Israel. Why? Because God says, when I say give them up, you're going to give them up. Even if I got to make you do it. Right? In just two years, almost 400,000 Russian Jews arrived in Israel. They averaged 16,600 per month. And for many years during this period, listen, Russia had a higher immigration uh, to Israel than any country on the planet. And it was obvious that the reason why they came back in droves was because when they got to Israel, it was just like we see today across our southern border. These people are given plush hotels to live in, immediate job, you got medical care, free education. No. That's what our country is doing. And that's being done, by the way, to deliberately destroy our economy. You can't keep that up. Amen. Biden's behind all that. And that's a whole other message. If we can never make it back to Schwab in the day. <laughs> but now in our study that interrupted our last study that interrupted our last study, let's get back to the point. The point is this, what? When God said, give them up, we're going to give them up. And again, they had no guarantee. This is what the other half. It isn't just that they came. 
They came with nothing. God literally, because it was time, in his time, only he knows the, the last days. So he began by his spirit to move on, the Jewish people, and they just literally, we got to get back. Because they had nothing. It wasn't easy. They didn't have any guarantees. Look at what they sacrificed. This is on top of coming back. This is what they were facing. They would have to abandon all valuables. Nobody's rushed to say, hey, oh, before you go, let's load you up with U-Hauls. Take all your stuff. No, they had to literally walk. Imagine walking away from everything. And not just, that was just the first part. Then they would face the necessity of learning Hebrew because they needed to come back to the original language, which, by the way, uh, is another prophecy sign that is happening. They would have to live in minimal housing. Again, they, weren't, they didn't have hotels there. They didn't have all, oh, hey, the government's kicked it. There is no government. You literally have to start from scratch. You get there and show up. It's like this giant camping thing, and you got to do everything from scratch. They walked away from that, right? They would face military service. Why? Because people don't want you there. And so it ain't going to be a piece of cake. Under the threat of death, they came back. They would find non-existent job market. There's nothing. You're starting all over. I mean, the us would go, well, before I make that move, I got, I'm going to go on the internet. I'm going to do some research. I'm going to make some phone calls. I'm going to guarantee I get a job lined up, and then I'll take that leap of faith. Yeah, what faith is that? They ain't got nothing. And they were willing to walk away from it all. They would have to pay some of the highest taxes in the world because, again, they're just starting out. Right? There's nothing. you got to start everything over from scratch. And only that, they would face the constant threat of terrorism and war. Trying to eke out an existence, farming, irrigation, all that stuff. Trying to get the land to respond again, which is another Bible prophecy sign. At the same time, you got to watch your back because somebody's wanting to kill you. Would you guys do that? Most of us never, we wouldn't even think of that. We want all these guarantees. And you know? I ain't going there. I ain't got no job. I don't know where I have a place to live. What a bunch of wimps. Right? We are. But why did they do this? Because the Spirit of God moved on them. Because guess what? The time is now. We're in the last days. And he's fulfilling his promises. And if he can fulfill his promises to Israel, you and I should be jumping up and down with our New Testament covenant with Jesus Christ is the point. But this is why it's happening. But wait a second. That was the east. That was the west. That was the north. What about the south? Watch this. In exact order. This was when uh, uh, May 25th, 1991... Israel struck a deal with Ethiopia's communist government that 14,500 Ethiopian Jews were finally allowed to leave. It was actually called Operation Solomon, and it was the basically almost every single black Ethiopian Jew that was down there. Again, God stirred their hearts. It's time to come home, right? Now, the big thing was uh, the government said, no way, Jose. There's your Mexican accent. I helped you guys out, okay? <laughs> anyway, that's right. That's what with the firemen. The firemen had uh, uh, two sons, a Mexican fireman, right? It, it, what do you name them? Ho Jose and Jose B. But anyway, that's right. But I digress. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Help me out. Do something. You guys didn't do it. I digress. Ethiopia said, no way, Jose. You guys are ever going to leave, okay? Uh, and so guess what? But when God says what? Oh, yeah, you will. They did. Now, watch how he arranged it, right? First of all, you're going like, Jews in Ethiopia? How do you, is that real? Yeah. A lot of people would point to a possibility of King Solomon, hence Operation Solomon, and Queen Sheba from Ethiopia, Second Chronicles 9. But we also know biblically there was, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Ethiopian Jews, because we see this in the book of Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch Jew. Okay, and then what happened? He got saved and received Jesus Christ as Messiah. Remember that with Philip the Evangelist? Okay, so we know that they were down there. But here's the point. In the late 1980s, the Jews of Ethiopia began to feel a tug on their hearts. All of a sudden, they're fine. And then all of a sudden, in mass, they not just said, we got to get back to the homeland, just like the Jews did in Russia. Watch this. They started migrating by the thousands. They camped out around the international airport down there in Ethiopia, demanding transportation to Israel. And we all know the government said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> No, they said, are you crazy? But what did God say? Not just to the north, give them up. He said to the south, what? Do not hold them back. And so guess what? God stirred up trouble there. And all of a sudden, 1991, the Ethiopian government began to crumble, the communist government there in the midst of a civil war. And so the United States and Israel struck a deal with them, and they gave them 48 hours to get these people out of here. Now watch this. Now what, what is that? That's 14,500 people. We have a hard enough time just dealing with two services. 
to get you in, get you out, right? 14,500, you got two days to get these people out of this country. Whoa. Now, here's what's amazing. In just 36 hours, 14,500 Ethiopian Jews, almost the entire population of them down there, was flown to Tel Aviv in 40 flights in 35, involving 35 aircraft. Listen, they actually broke a world record. At one point, there were 28 planes in the air at one time. Watch this. The world record was when uh, one of the Boeing 747s that's designed to carry about 350 people, they loaded it up with 1,086. Uh, maybe it was flying like this. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, how they do that? They ripped out all the seats to maximize. Because you've got 48 hours. You've got to get out. The Spirit of God is moving on the people, the Jewish people, right? Now, what's wild is that particular plane, when it arrived at Tel Aviv, they started off with 1,086. When it landed in Tel Aviv, they had 1,088 because two babies were born in Rome. Still not the half of it. One guy says, when I read that, I couldn't help but think of this prophecy in Jeremiah 31. Behold, I'm bringing them from the north country, and I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth, among them the blind, the lame, and who? The woman with child, and she who is in labor with child together. A great company, they will return there. Isn't that wild? Every jot, every tittle of scripture is coming to pass if you read the Bible. So basically, over 6 million Jews as many as were killed, unfortunately, in the Holocaust, came back to the Jewish land. They're still coming back every year over there in exact order from the east, from the west, from the north, and the south to the land that God gave to them from the get-go. Unconditional promise. And it's a huge mega sign, folks, that we are living in the last days like this guy shows. Watch this. The ingathering of the exiles, it's the most prophesied event in the Bible. It's mentioned over 40 times, unprecedented in history. Never before has a nation been scattered across the world and then ingathered to its ancient homeland. And yet every single prophet mentions this miraculous feat that will happen. Behold, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, the pregnant and the birthing together. A great congregation will return here. And now they have been returned to the land. And the land is still carrying the names of the great history of this people. It's unbelievable. Today in Israel, you see universalism. Jews from Ethiopia, Africa, Asia, North America, South America, Russia, the entire world has now returned to the land of Israel. And again, this is not just a major mega sign that we're in the last days. You and I should be jumping up and down out of our socks, for those of you that wear socks. <laughs> that, listen, what's the common sense conclusion? If God, and we're seeing it happen, if God keeps his unconditional promise with the Jewish people to return them to the land that he gave them from the beginning in spite of their behavior, then you and I can trust him with our unconditional new covenant with Jesus Christ that we are going to get to heaven in spite of our behavior. This is no small issue here, folks, right? Because if you say that God is done with the Jewish people, then we can't trust God because that means he's not keeping his promises. That's a big issue. Now, with all that said, it leads to some promises that we're seeing in the news today. That's what the Bible says. That should determine our faith, rule, and practice, sola scriptura. But God shares these amazing pro uh, prophecies that he gave them the land, he's going to return the land, all that stuff. But you have a lie in the church called replacement theology. And it's a lie and a horrible false teaching uh, because they literally would teach so-called fellow Christians that God is done with the Jewish people they lost the land, and he's not even on their radar. They're not even on his radar, and the whole focus now of God is only on the church. Hence, the church has replaced replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Now, Lord willing, if we're still alive and still here, we're going to deal with other aspects. This is the land conflict today. We'll get into the religious conflict, the military conflict, the temple conflict, and we'll probably end on the anti-Semitism conflict. But this is the disturbing stuff that's even going on in the news. This replacement theology is supposed to be Christians. 
And, 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 and that's what these guys would do. They say, no, uh, God has rejected them. The church has replaced them. And I'll give you some of the evidence of that in a second. But they say, here's the problem. They say Israel has no right to this land. God is done with them, right? Now, this attitude basically is called anti-Zionism, the belief that the Jews have no right to the land and it belongs to these other people. And so they need to walk away and give it back. That's what you're seeing in the media. But again, if it's, it's crazy that uh, we've already seen God gave it to them. But again, I want to drill this point home. It's an unconditional promise for the land. Just like our unconditional New Testament promise, Jesus. God gave one to the Jewish people. Specifically, I'm going to give you this land. And it's a forever promise. And it will forever be yours. Even though for a while I'm going to discipline you and I'm going to scatter you. But I'm going to bring you back to the land that I gave you. And we're not making this up. It's their land. It's always been their land. It's their land today. But let me give you some of that proof, right? First of all, let's deal with the unconditional covenant. It's called the Abrahamic covenant, made by God to Abram, later changed Abraham. We see this in Genesis 12 and 15. By the way, if you uh, understand the chronological history there, this was long before any Muslim came about. Okay? So this was what happened first. Okay? And let's take a look at that. Genesis 12. One through three, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household and go to the what? The land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth uh, will be blessed through you. Now, here's the unconditional part of that. Chapter 15, God doesn't just say it. He makes a contract or covenant. Now, notice how that went about. Abram believed the Lord, and he was credited to him as righteous. Now, stop right there. He believed God's promise. That's it. Just like you and I. I believe God's promise that if I ask Jesus Christ to forgive me all my sins and believe that it's his death to forgive me my sins, I'm going to heaven. Not of works. It's called unconditional. So Abraham did the same thing. He took God his word that he's going to do this, which included the land. So the Lord said to him, bring me, and here's the contract they made back in the day, bring me a heifer and a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these things to him, cut them in two, arranged the halves opposite to each other. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into what? A deep sleep. He was watching Pastor Billy's sermons. He wasn't watching my sermons. Who said that? That's not funny. I wasn't even around back then. Here's my point. How much involvement do you have in a contract if you're... <laughs> and not just to sleep, what's it say? Deep sleep. Right? And a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Now when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared, passing between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give what? This lamp. Well, gee, if we only knew what was the parameters. Well, he tells you right here. Hello. From the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadamites, Hittites, Parasites, or I mean, per Parasites, the Raphaites, the Amorites, the Canaanites. Now, that's back in Arkansas. I'm telling you, back down there, Bug City. But anyway, uh, Hittites, Parasites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and the Jebusites, which eventually became Jerusalem. Uh, and again, this was the unconditional covenant. Abram would not have been sleeping through the contract if he was dependent on his behavior. He'd be walking through that. But God sent the message, no, it's on me. I, I guarantee that just like he did it with us in our new contract. Do you get it? God did the same thing for the Jewish people with the promise, specifically with the land, a promise of a descendants, and that they'd be a blessing to the nations. So it's an unconditional. Could you help you say, well, that was then. That was the Old Testament. But you know, we all know Israel blew it. That's why. You, and so they don't have any right to. That's a lie. It's an unconditional promise. It is theirs from God and it is theirs forever. You're like, well, that's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? Last time I checked, God made the earth. And so if he wants to give a slice of it to somebody, he can do that. Hello? It's his in the first place. In fact, read the Bible. I highly recommend it for some strange reason. You see this in Psalm 24, right? The earth is whose? The Lord. And keep reading. In case you don't get it, uh, everything in it, uh, in the whole world. And, oh, that's right, all who live in it too. Animals, people, you know, it's all God. So if God wants to give a slice of it to somebody and say, I'm going to give that one to you forever, that piece of real estate, then it's his prerogative. And he didn't just say he was going to do it. He did it, unconditional promise. And then if you keep reading the Bible, which I still highly recommend, he says, I'm going to give it to you forever. 
He says it multiple times. Genesis 17, 7 through 8. I will establish my covenant as a what? Everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now as an alien, I will give as a what? Everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Psalm 105. O descendants of Abraham, his servant. O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant. How long? Forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with who? Abraham. And the oath that he swore to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. To Israel as a what? An everlasting covenant. To you I will give what? The land of Canaan, the portion you will inherit. Ezekiel 37, they will live in the land that I gave my servant Jacob, the land where your fathers live. They and their children and their children's children will live there. How long? Forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. And Paul even reiterates this. The everlasting covenant is irrevocable in the New Testament. Romans chapter 11. But as far as the election is concerned, they, the context, the Jewish people, are loved on the account of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? For God's gifts and his call are what? Irrevocable. In other words, when God makes a promise, it's going to happen. Not just ours. Praise God, the new covenant, that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, ask him to forgive your sins. Trust that it is his death and his death alone on the cross that is sufficient from God to forgive you of all of your sins, to release you from punishment. We're going to heaven. It's going to happen. He did the same thing with the Jewish people as an everlasting covenant with the land. It's theirs. It's been theirs from the get-go. Before any Muslim appeared on the scene, any of the other nations appeared on the scene, God says, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you forever. In fact, again, you take a look at it. Unfortunately, I'll get to this in a second. Israel has given up a lot of what is called the promised land. You look at the original dimensions, it was way bigger than what you have today. And we'll get to what God also says for those who would have the audacity to divide up my land. It doesn't go well with those people. Okay. In fact, watch this. I just gave you what, about a half dozen? There are over 130 verses in the Bible that reiterate the truth that the land of Israel was divinely given to the Jewish people forever. Not one, not three, not 13, 130, over 130. And yet, back to that replacement theology. God's done to the Israel people. The whole conflict could be over. We wouldn't even be watching this in the news if, if people would realize that God's only focused on the church. He's done with the Jewish people. They have no right to this land. They're the troublemakers. No called replacement theology. Again, we'll probably have a study on this, Lord willing, later in great detail. But let me give you a reason why we're seeing what we're seeing from the so-called Christian community right now. Replacement theology. It's a big fat lie. Now watch this. This is from a so-called Christian magazine. And I'm going to quote from you from that so-called Christian magazine what they say about Israel. Right? Watch this. Direct quote from a Christian magazine. It is a mistake for Christians to exalt Israelis to the position of being God's chosen people in a so-called Christian magazine. Not only that, they say the progressive revelation of scriptures makes it clear that today God has only one people and it is the church. What? Hey, I expect this attitude from the world. I don't condone it, but I expect it because they don't know Christ. They don't follow the Bible, but people professing to be Christians? What Bible you read? They go on. They say, we must not apply Old Testament prophecies to the state of Israel when Jesus, Peter, and Paul have radically redirected our thinking concerning the covenants of the promise. They are now directed to the church, which is ridiculous. So God made promises. We just saw specifically the land. He even gave us the exact dimensions of the land. So does that mean that it belongs to us? The whole thing's messed up because that's a lie. It's crazy, folks. Right? And again, they say, watch this, the Israeli claim to Palestine as a Jewish state by divine right is incorrect. And their continued enforcement of this claim by military oppression is unjust. This is the baloney that's going on in the church. One guy says this, these statements are typical of what's taught in replacement theology, teaches that the church has replaced Israel. How could this substitution be possible? Uh, maybe if you don't read the Bible, would be my guess. This is nuts, folks. But can I tell you something? This is all over the church today. And this is what's alarming. It's bad enough that things are going on that we're seeing over there. But you got professing Christians that are basically out there with all kinds of anti-Semitism repeating the lie, 
See, we wouldn't have this conflict because God's done with these people and they have no right to the land. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Now, let's go back to the other problem. That's the first problem. There's another argument that comes up over the land. This is why we're seeing this conflict. And the people say uh, that that land does not belong to Israel. And whether it's replacement theology or just the non-Christian, because they don't read the Bible, they don't trust the Bible. We just saw it's all over the Bible. But they say that land belongs to the Palestinians. And Israel needs to give it back to them because it's theirs. Well, let's examine that. And here's the phrase that they come up with. You've probably seen this already in the media out there. They say it belongs to the Palestinians and the Jewish people. Listen, here's the, they deliberately say this phrase. They are illegally occupying the land. So when you go home today, you are illegally occupying your home. No, it's your home. What do you mean illegal occupying? But they say that to get it into your mind that they're doing something wrong. It's their land. But let's examine this whole idea of a Palestine. First of all, did you know there is and never has been a country called Palestine? Let that sink in. I'm going to prove it to you. I'll say it again. There is and never has been a country called Palestine. It is not a country. It has never been a country. It's a regional name. Let me give you some examples. We would say like the states on the East Coast, we call those New England because it's their own country. Well, sometimes with the behavior, you wonder, but no, seriously. Uh, no, but no, no, it's, it's a region of the country called America. It's not a country. Give me another example. I mentioned Midwest, Kansas, Arkansas. Got the ticks, bugs, weird stuff. Okay, but... Uh, <laughs> But that, we call that part of the country the Bible Belt. I grew up in the Bible Belt in Kansas, in that area. And when I went to apply the first time for my passport, I don't know if you guys did, but I put this, they said, what, what's your nationality? I said, Bible Beltian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm American. Right? Well, because it's a region of a country. It's not a country. It's just a label to describe a region, an area. That's Palestine. It has never been a country Number one. So if it's never been a country, then how could Israel be illegally occupying their supposed country when it's never been a country? Do you get it? It gets worse. Furthermore, the name of the region, Palestine, came as a result of the Romans, out of spite, renaming Israel Palestine. But it's always been Israel. Let's take a trip through history and prove that point. Watch this. We often hear these historical claims about the Palestinians. What's fact and what's fiction? Early versions of the name Palestine refer to a small region on the Mediterranean coast bordering Egypt and to the Philistines, an ancient Greek people that, like many others, have vanished over time and have no connection to today's Palestinians. The word Palestine was first formally used by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. During his rule, Hadrian massacred the rebellious Jewish population in the Kingdom of Judea and sent most of the remaining Jewish population into exile. Hadrian was determined to obliterate thousands of years of Jewish presence in the land that is documented with extensive archaeological findings and place names we still use today. And so, he decided to rename the province of Judea, Syria, Palestina, after the vanished nemesis of the ancient Jews, the Philistines. There you go. And the Philistines, as a people, are no longer in existence, but out of spite from the Romans, who hated the Jews, renamed the area. Palestine, that's where it came from. Which means, listen carefully, historically... There is no Palestinian people. Do you understand? We've been lied to. We're still being lied to. And the church is going, yeah, it belongs to them. Who? There is no historically a Palestinian people, historically speaking. The term Palestine was just a renaming out of spite of Judea belonging to the Jewish people. But there are no true Palestinians. And so the question is, they, all right, well, then who are these people claiming to be Palestinians, claiming to be a country when it's never been a country and there's no people, historically speaking, Palestinians? Well, let's expose that. They're the Arabs of that 
area, and I'll explain how they got there and why they're still there, okay? But go back to the scripture. Did God give the promise of the land to the Arab community? No. Abraham tried, but watch what God said, right? Let's take a look at that promise, Genesis 17. So two chapters after the makes the covenant, unconditional covenant. And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael, from which we have the Arab community, the Muslim community, might live under your blessing. What did God say? My covenant I will establish with who? Isaac. It's only with the Jewish people. So no matter what they say in the media, the Arabs who call themselves Palestinians, who are a descendant of Ishmael, they have no part in the Abrahamic land covenant from God. I didn't say that God did. Only descendants of Isaac, who gave birth to Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, which came the 12 tribes, is where we get the accurate name for an actual country by an actual people, still to this day, called Israel. There is no Palestinian people in essence. You go, well, who are these people then? I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. But then you have people that sit there and say, uh, well, wait a second. Maybe, okay, uh, that's the case. But these people, Israel, the Jewish people, they're being really greedy with this land. And this conflict will go away if they would just share it. Right? You hear that all the time. You just need to share it. You just need to share it with these people because they need a place to live. Okay? Well, let's put that in the vernacular. Let's say you own a home. Let's say you might even have some property with you, maybe a couple acres or whatever. Would it be right for the government, a foreign country, somebody, a stranger, literally force you to share your home with people who have no right to your home that you don't even know? And they're not just total strangers, but they also admittedly want to kill you and take your home. That's what's going on here. Because we all know when the government says, hey, we're going to give your home over to these people and you're going to just have to do it. That's the good old American way. Are you kidding me? But that's what would be happening if the government were to come and say, listen, everybody that lives in Nevada, uh, give up your home. We've got to make room for these people. It's like, well, this is my home. So what? You're, you're, you're being greedy. You need to share. What do you mean share? It's my house. <laughs> that's what's going on. Okay? Now, I don't recommend this because we're going to get to that at the end. Israel has already tried multiple times to give up land. They shouldn't have done it. They still shouldn't have. This whole two-state solution is not blessed by God. But to be fair, people say, oh, they're being greedy. They just won't share. They have tried repeatedly, and every single time, the Palestinian people have said no. But Israel somehow is the bad guy. Let's take a look at that proof. Watch this. If Israel just allowed the Palestinians to have a state of their own, there would be peace in the Middle East, right? That's what you hear from UN ambassadors, European diplomats, and most college professors. But what if I told you that Israel has already offered the Palestinians a state of their own, and not just once, but on five separate occasions? Don't believe me? Let's review the record. After the breakup of the Ottoman Empire following World War I, Britain took control of most of the Middle East, including the area that constitutes modern Israel. Seventeen years later, in 1936, the Arabs rebelled against the British and against their Jewish neighbors. The British formed a task force, the Peel Commission, to study the cause of the rebellion. The commission concluded that the reason for the violence was that two peoples, Jews and Arabs, wanted to govern the same land. The answer, the Peel Commission concluded, would be to create two independent states, one for the Jews and one for the Arabs, a two-state solution. The suggested split was heavily in favor of the Arabs. The British offered them 80% of the disputed territory, the Jews the remaining 20%. Yet, despite the tiny size of their proposed state, the Jews voted to accept this offer, but the Arabs rejected it and resumed their violent rebellion. Rejection number one. Ten years later, in 1947, the British asked the United Nations to find a new solution to the continuing tensions. Like the Peel Commission, the UN decided that the best way to resolve the conflict was to divide the land. In November 1947, the UN voted to create two states. Again, the Jews accepted the offer, and again, 
the Arabs rejected it. Only this time, they did so by launching an all-out war. Rejection number two. Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria joined the conflict, but they failed. Israel won the war and got on with the business of building a new nation. Most of the land set aside by the UN for an Arab state, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, became occupied territory, occupied not by Israel, but by Jordan. 20 years later, in 1967, the Arabs, led this time by Egypt and joined by Syria and Jordan, once again sought to destroy the Jewish state. The 1967 conflict, known as the Six-Day War, ended in a stunning victory for Israel. Jerusalem and the West Bank, as well as the area known as the Gaza Strip, fell into Israel's hands. The government split over what to do with this new territory. Half wanted to return the West Bank to Jordan and Gaza to Egypt in exchange for peace. The other half wanted to give it to the region's Arabs, who had begun referring to themselves as the Palestinians in the hope that they would ultimately build their own state there. Neither initiative got very far. A few months later, the Arab League met in Sudan and issued its infamous three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. Again, a two-state solution was dismissed by the Arabs, making this rejection number three. In 2000, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak met at Camp David with Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat to conclude a new two-state plan. Barak offered Arafat a Palestinian state in all of Gaza and 94% of the West Bank, with East Jerusalem as its capital. But the Palestinian leader rejected the offer. In the words of U.S. President Bill Clinton, Arafat was here 14 days and said no to everything. Instead, the Palestinians launched a bloody wave of suicide bombings that killed over 1,000 Israelis and maimed thousands more on buses, in wedding halls, and in pizza parlors. Rejection number four. In 2008, Israel tried yet again. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert went even further than Ehud Barak had, expanding the peace offer to include additional land to sweeten the deal. Like his predecessor, the new Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, turned the deal down. Rejection number five. In between these last two Israeli offers, Israel unilaterally left Gaza, giving the Palestinians complete control there. Instead of developing this territory for the good of its citizens, the Palestinians turned Gaza into a terrorist base from which they have fired thousands of rockets into Israel. Each time Israel has agreed to a Palestinian state, the Palestinians have rejected the offer, often violently. And yet Israel's the bad guy who just will not share their home to people who have no right to it, who on tape, if you listen to their media, as he said, their policy is no, no, no. And what the only thing they say yes to is the complete annihilation of Israel. You'll never see that in our media because they block it. But that's what Israel is dealing with. They've tried. They've tried. They've tried. I don't recommend it because you shouldn't split the land. But they've tried. And yet again, it's out there. Somehow they're being the bad guy. One diplomat, he said this in the Jerusalem Post. I loved it. He says, the Arabs never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> because that's not what they want. They don't want a two-state solution. It's their way or the highway, which involves the annihilation of Israel. But let's go back to those people that are there. Again, Palestine is not a country. It's never been a country. Historically speaking, technically, there is no such people as Pal uh, Palestinians. It's the Arabs, but you're going like, okay, well, that they call Palestinians. How do they get to the area? Why are they Palestinian refugees? Because there are people there floating around without a place. But listen to the trickery of the Muslim Arab community. First of all, again, they're not even a, pe a people, but the Arab descendants of Ishmael, again, have no right to the land. But listen, the Palestinian people, they're really Arabs kind of floating around, are political pawns in the hands of the Muslim nations who are the ones who created these wandering peoples in the first place out of a promise of annihilating Israel. Let me explain it. 
They're using them still to this day. They purposely will not take care of them so that they can become the excuse as to make Israel be the bad guy. And here's how it happened. The Muslim nations in the past told, as you saw, many wars coming against Israel. But God's not done with them. And they, people coming against Israel lose every time. The Muslim nations in the past told the Arabs living in the area to leave their homes and let them, the Muslims, destroy Israel. And when they were dis, uh, done destroying the Jewish people, then these Arabs could go back to their homes. And on top of that, you get all the homes of the Israelis that they just annihilated. Well, guess what? That was the promise. That was the carrot that these Arabs took from the Muslim nations. And guess what? They lost. So guess what? Now they're wandering around. But listen, the, the Muslim nations refused to take care of these refugees that they created in the first place. And come up with this lie that they're the owners of the land and they're not. And that they're, they're a country that they're not. And that historically they're not even a people. They're refugees that they created in the prospect of annihilating Israel. Now listen, didn't they say that, well, they need to make room. Israel needs to make room. They need to share. Are you kidding me? You take a comparison of the land of Israel, which is theirs from God. And then you look at all the land that the Muslim nations have in comparison. This is a joke. And let me bring that out to you visually. Watch this. Now, in terms of Israel giving up land, they gave back the Sinai. They gave the Gaza Strip. How much land does Israel actually have in comparison to the other countries in the region? I'd like for you to see a comparison of Israel compared to uh, these other countries and using the United States as our template so that you can get an idea visually of how all this looks like. What we're going to do is we're going to compare the members of the Arab League, not counting the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and we're going to add Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan to this mix. And we're going to compare those countries with Israel. And the following maps are to scale. First of all, we're going to start in Northwest Africa. Morocco, Western Sahara, Mauritania. So you get an idea based on the map what they look like. Algeria, Tunisia, compared to the United States. Going farther east, Libya, Sudan. Djibouti, Somalia, Comoros, these are all Arab League nations with a few added. Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, going farther east, Iraq, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and Yemen. And then finally, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And now Israel. Just about every time I show these maps, I get that same response. We don't understand how small Israel is. Sometimes Israel is compared to the state of New Jersey. I compare it more to Lake Michigan. The whole country of Israel can fit inside Lake Michigan. Yet the world says they have too much land. The total land mass of all the Arab League states is 464 times greater than that of Israel's. So I ask the question, is there no room for a Jewish state? The world says, apparently, no, or we'll determine how large. We'll carve it up. You get it? Big lie. Israel's one being greedy. They refuse to share the Palestinian refugees were created by the Muslim communities. There is no country, Palestine. There's really, technically, historically speaking, no Palestinian people. It's the Arabs who got duped by the Muslims out of greed, thinking they're going to annihilate Israel. It backfired. And then you saw how much landmass they have. And you mean to tell me you can't take care of these people that you created? But Israel is the bad guy? It's a lie. But speaking of, again, because I guarantee you how far this current conflict, Israel-Hamas, is starting to grow. 
they're going to have that as the solution. They're going to want to split Israel again, even though that's the biggest joke of all. You better listen to what God says to people that do that, including our own government, including the Biden administration. Joel 3 says this, God says, In those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. Why? Because they didn't just scatter my people among the nations. They what? They divided up my land. It's God's land. It's always been his land. He owns the earth and everything in it. And so therefore, as the creator, if he wants to give a slice, as you saw, a tiny slice of the planet of real estate to his people he has all rights to do that and don't you dare say it's not theirs or even try to divide it up god says you're headed for judgment and yet that's what everybody's saying needs to be done you're headed for judgment it's a sign that we're living the last days turn on the news the bible is the only book on the planet that tells us why this conflict is happening this is just the first reason why today it's over the land. The sad irony is there is no conflict over that question. It's Israel's land. And they have a right to that land from God, not man. It's a sign we're in the last days. So again, as the world is preparing for war, the point for you and I is the Christian with our unconditional covenant with Jesus as the bride of Christ, they're preparing for war, but we're preparing for a wedding because all this means is our wedding day is fast approaching because we are out of here before that seven-year tribulation starts. That's why Jesus said when these things begin to take place, including what we're seeing in the news over Israel, you better stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. If you're here today, you're watching online, man, how much more proof does God got to give you that the, we're in the last days? How much more proof does God got to give you that, listen, you don't want to be left behind. You think this is bad now? This is chump change compared to the wars. We just saw the opening text. Just in the first half, there's a global war that's going to break out, then a global famine, and then comes that thing that what? Two billion people died, not just from the sword, famine, plague, but wild beasts. It's worse than the ticks of Arkansas. God has made an unconditional covenant that you must receive as a gift. This time through Jesus, the Messiah of all, including the Jewish people. They don't get it, and they won't get it, unfortunately, until the seven-year tribulation. But if you get it today as a non-Jewish, a Gentile, then you could be spared from the wrath to come. Because all this evil, all these lies, all the tyranny, all the baloney that's going on, God is going to have the last word on all of it. It's called Judgment Day. But the only reason why it hasn't fallen yet is because the scripture is clear. He's not willing that any should perish. He's given you an opportunity to escape through Christ. Receive him today as your Savior, please. But as the church, what do we do? We should be getting excited about the wedding day. We should be inviting other people to join us for the wedding day, right? And said, you know what we got going on in the church today? Have you seen the news? While this is on, one of the biggest prophecy signs is happening right now. Just turn on your TV. And you know what the, world, what the church is doing? The church is doing this. When I first came across this photo, I actually thought it was Photoshop. So I did some research. And you know what? That's a real photo. You know what it is? And I quote, I'm not joking. This is a photo of a guy in uh, from Hawaii's Kilauea volcano, as it's erupting, what's he doing? Got to finish my game. He's literally playing golf with a volcano blowing up in the back of him. It's a legit photo. Check it out. And I'm going, what? Are you serious? Who does this? But can I tell you something? The same thing's going on in the church. One of the biggest signs that we're headed towards the seven-year tribulation, in other words, the planet's about to blow up, is on the news. Uh, Pastor Billy, come on, wrap this up. I got to go watch the game. <laughs> it's the same attitude, man. What are you doing? We're distracted. Or our heart's not in the right place. And let me share with this. I just got this from uh, one of our Christian friends in New Jersey. 
that illustrates that. They said this past Sunday at church, the day after Israel was attacked, everybody, listen, was talking about the Phillies game and the Eagles. That's, that's all people want to talk about in the church. Right after they were attacked. Listen, and then last night, this would be Wednesday. Last night, our pastor did a prophecy update, half an hour long, and then went into a Q&A. And when I read that, I'm going like, oh, that's awesome. That's what a shepherd should do. Yes, that's why we have to interrupt our studies, because we've got to get equipped with what's going on in the world. The Bible's the most relative book on the planet, right? This is amazing. Let's, find, let's get it right. Let's not get it wrong. But listen to what she said. So kudos to the pastor, but she said this. So he goes into the Q&A, quote, not one question. He just stood there when he said, any question? Any question? You know why? Because he wanted to go home. Listen to this. He thought he was getting, after a long, no, no response from the whole congregation, he thought he was getting an answer, but it was somebody telling the score of the Phillies game. Quote, the pastor was so upset, he just ended the service. Mm-hmm. He, she said, last night was the shortest Wednesday service we ever had. That's what's going on. The planet is about to blow the seven-year tribulation. We're not worried about being there. But instead of playing golf or being worried about the baseball game or the football game or anything else, or I got to go clean my dog's toenails or go shopping or do whatever you, whatever the thing is, hurry up, Pastor, get it done, get it done. And then when we have an opportunity to respond biblically, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and I'm going to give the evil eye to that person that keeps asking those questions. You've been there. <laughs> Why? Because you don't want to be there because that's not where your heart's at. You're more concerned about this wicked world system, the state of the economy, than people's souls for all eternity. Shame on us if that's our attitude. Turn on your news, man. We're in the last days. They're preparing for war. We're preparing for a wedding. But God doesn't want us to get there empty-handed. We need to get out there and tell people, come to the wedding. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you so much for interrupting our last study that interrupted our last study. Now with this study. And it's not by chance. If anything, it's just, man, things are happening so fast. But it's, it's not for us to be scared about. We certainly don't condone the evil and the wickedness that's going on. But for we, your church, who've received your unconditional covenant promise through Jesus Christ, it's just a, yet another layer of news showing us from your word a reminder that you're about to come get us. That's all this is. And so we need to be faithful, not fearful. Because our lives are in your hands, both now and forevermore. And so help us to finish strong, God. May we be more concerned about lost souls than losing the game. And if we're off track, get us on track today. But God, again, if there's anybody here that's not truly born again, please save them now before it's too late. The whole planet's going to turn into a gigantic volcano very shortly. And you've made a way out through Jesus Christ that they could be forgiven and set free from that. Not only seven years of hell on earth, but hell forever. God, please, work in their heart today that they would receive you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior before it's too late. But thank you for our study. Thank you for caring enough to interrupt our plans to make sure we're in line with your plan. We love you. We pray and ask all this in your wonderful name. In Jesus' name. And all God's people.